You know, one of the characteristics of the last days is that people would be out without natural affection. You know what that means? Uh, there would be unnatural affection. Uh, for instance, mothers would uh, not want their babies and uh, men would not love women, but men would love men and women would love women. That's not natural affection. That is a characteristic of the last days. However, as a general rule, mothers love their babies. I've seen more mothers love their babies than mothers that don't love their babies. You don't have to have a law in place, probably there is, that mothers have to love their babies and take care of their babies, that mothers have to feed their babies and change their babies' diapers and and uh, take care of their babies when they're sick, so forth and so on. You don't need a, there's a inbred law, a natural affection that God puts in human beings and in mothers to lovingly take care of their babies. If you're a child of God, there is a supernatural love that God himself has shed abroad in your heart. And that love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit causes you not only to love God, but to love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. What I see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 is just genuine love of the brethren. By the way, brethren is a plural that means male and female, okay? or the brothers and sisters in the Lord. There is a real sense of that in Paul's words in this third chapter that we're in uh, this morning. Because if you really love the brethren, you'll be concerned about their total welfare, not just their physical well-being, but even more importantly, you'll be concerned about their spiritual welfare. And that comes out very clear in Paul's words in this chapter. He wanted to be sure that spiritually, the church there in Thessalonica was moving forward spiritually. He wasn't there long, just several months. And uh, then he had to flee. And he wanted to be certain that they were making forward spiritual progress. To do so requires three things that Paul brings out in this chapter. And I want to share them with you after we pause a moment and pray together. Father in heaven, we're just grateful to be able to gather in your name. We thank you for sending the Spirit of God, your Spirit, to be here with us right now. We want him to lift up Christ. We pray that you would open the minds, the hearts, the souls of each one of us to what it is, Spirit of God, that you have to say to us. We don't want to miss anything, so keep us from distractions. Lord, we know that we have opposition. Whenever we do the will of God, there's always opposition. And we know specifically who the opposer is. But we thank you that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, far above him and all of his demons. And so, Lord, we take the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name, we bind that strong man, and we pray that he would not be allowed to disrupt or distract. Keep us focused on what it is you want us to hear and what you want us to see about yourself today and about us. We'll just thank you, Lord, for this time. You know the spiritual needs of every single person. And so meet them as only you can. We pray for Jesus' glory. Amen. In the first five verses, I think one of the first requirements for a people's spiritual well-being 
is what I would uh, sum up as as uh, and call fellowshipping. We need fellowship. And Paul was very concerned about that because if you go back and you read what happened in the book of Acts, chapter 17, when he was in this city of Thessalonica, what happened was he was just in that synagogue for several weeks and uh, the, the Jewish uh, people began to get jealous and didn't uh, like the, the following that he was garnering. And so they stirred up trouble. And eventually Paul had to flee from the city of Thessalonica. And from there, he went to Berea. You remember the Bereans? The Bereans were also skeptical, but they were a little more open-minded and they were checking the scrolls to see that what Paul was teaching about Jesus the Messiah was in line with what the scripture taught. And, uh, but then those same Jewish troublemakers followed Paul from Thessalonica and eventually arrived. They heard he was in Berea. They arrived there and they chased him again. And this time, Paul left behind Timothy and Silas, but he went to the city of Athens. And it's in the city of Athens where he has that opportunity to stand uh, before the town council there in the Areopagus and uh, preach the gospel about the unknown God. You remember that? But anyway, that's the background to this. So later on, Timothy and Silas joined Paul in the city of Athens. And then Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica for a visit to help these believers because he knew that the Jewish uh, <clears throat> group that was persecuting him was obviously stirring up trouble and persecuting the believers that he left behind in that city. And so Paul then goes from Athens, he goes to Corinth, and it's from Corinth that uh, Timothy returns and gives a report of what was going on there in the city of Thessalonica. It was a good report, and Paul was pleased and encouraged by it. And it is from the city of Corinth, then, that Paul writes the letter to the Thessalonians that we're looking at this very morning. That's the background. But what he talks about, as I said in these first five verses, is about fellowshipping. Look at, he says, when we could no longer forbear, 1 Thessalonians 3.1, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. We sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions or persecutions. For you yourselves know that, that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we'd suffer per tribulation even as it came to pass, and you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He's very concerned. This is brotherly love, <laughs> this kind of concern. And uh, he is interested in their fellowshipping. The concern that he expresses is really a part of fellowship. If you really fellowship with God's people, you'll have this type of concern one for another. See the first word in verse 1 of chapter 3, wherefore, that connects what he had just said in verses 70 to 20. And you remember what that was about. He, was, uh, he had such a deep love for these people that it was unbearable for him to be separated from them. Uh, and so he says, we couldn't take it. Uh, we thought it good uh, to be left at Athens. And the word left there carries the same degree of emotion that a person who has lost a loved one would grieve. That's what the word left means. And so he's deeply feeling his concern for these people. He's bereaved over them, and uh, he realizes the importance 
of these believers being established because he knows they're suffering persecution for their faith. They're being afflicted because they're simply because they're Christians. And so he feels uh, it very important to preserve what God had so wonderfully and really quickly accomplished there in that city. The bottom line is that he was filled with brotherly love. That's what his ministry was about. He loved people, and specifically, he loved the people of God. And so he was deeply concerned about them. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15, if you want to know the level in which brotherly love and brotherly love and concern should grip a person, he says, I am willing and I have spent and I, I am willing to be spent totally in order to be a blessing to you spiritually. Really, this kind of concern that is a part of fellowship is that kind of real denying self and dying to self in order to love the brethren more than you love yourself. You remember what Paul said to the Ephesian pastors there in Acts chapter 20? He said, brethren, he said, I don't count my own life dear unto myself. I don't worry about what happens to Paul. I don't worry about what's going to happen to me, uh, be it through persecution or anything else. What I'm concerned about is that I fulfill the ministry that God's given me. And that ministry, of course, included this kind of brotherly love, this kind of concern where you love the brethren more than you love yourself. As you sit here this morning or as you listen, I wonder, could it honestly be said of you that you love, look around, that you love the brethren more than you love yourself? That's a tough one, isn't it? If we're honest, that's a tough one. But that's the kind of supernatural love that God wants each one of us to have, that he put in our heart, that he wants us to release through our lives. There's that kind of concern. Here's a second thing that I wanted you to note here about uh, fellowshipping. Not only does it involve concern, but Paul makes it very clear. It involves character. Um where he says in the second verse that he sent uh, Timothy, uh, a fellow laborer in the gospel. Uh, he, in, in fellowship, there has to be that, not only that concern, but that character, the ability to, to edify others requires spiritual character on our part. You know, the thing that really, I think, separates Christian fellowship from any other kind of fellowship, listen to me, is this. You know that when you're born again, something amazing, something supernatural happens to you. At the moment you're born again, you are severed in your human spirit from indwelling sin. You're severed from sin. Sin still abides in your soul, but you've been cut free. You've been given then union with Jesus, and he becomes your life. You become united to Jesus, and he is your life. You, In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says that in a believer, the moment you're born again, your human spirit is joined permanently to the spirit of Christ. Wow. What that means for us as brethren is this. If I'm a believer and my spirit is joined to Christ and you're a believer and your spirit is joined to Christ, that means that my human spirit and your human spirit are joined together. Now that's a connection that is that far exceeds any physical connection. That is a deep connection a spiritual connection, and that is at the basis of real love for the brethren, loving one another. That's at the basis of serving one another, of humbly giving as Paul was willing to 
pour yourself out for others. That is really the crux of what it means to have fellowship. Paul calls Timothy that kind. He calls him a fellow laborer, a surrendered follower of God, a spiritual leader like Paul that is willing to spend himself and continue to be spent, to be poured out, as uh, I think Oswald Chambers says, like broken bread and poured out wine. Spiritual character, part of fellowshipping. Your fellowship is very, uh, our fellowship, I should say, is very weak and not very helpful unless this kind of character is uh, in us. And that is the character, the life of Jesus himself is what I'm talking about. And then there's a third aspect of fellowshipping that needs to be uh, spoken of. And it's in verses three to five. And those verses are all about conflict. There's conflict in fellowship. Here he's talking about conflict from outside the church. Here he's talking about persecution. And he makes it very clear that, uh, verse 3, you shouldn't be moved by this because that's what we're appointed to. In other words, persecution, affliction, is a very normal part of the believing life. However, we know that Satan uses this in many Christian lives. He's the perpetrator. He's behind the scenes in all of this affliction and persecution. And he uses it in various ways to weaken believers. He says in verse 3, that no man should be moved. I want you to note the word moved there. No man should be moved by these afflictions. The word moved there means to shake. I think about a, uh, a dog grabbing a stuffed toy and, and just shaking it. The devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he, he may devour. He'd like to shake us. Shake the faith, and trust out of us. It's dangerous, very dangerous, to have a wrong reaction to persecution or trials. But that's what Satan likes to do. Actually, the word move there literally means to wag the tail. When a dog wags his tail, he's happy, right? When a dog wags his tail, he's trying to be friendly. And perhaps it means that one of the most dangerous ways that Satan attacks believers when they're persecuted or when they're in trials is he tries to be friendly to them and flatter them through unbelievers. Remember in chapter 2 and verse 18, Paul says Satan prevented him from personally visiting that church in some way, and I don't know how, but here he's telling us, that Satan uses flattery, if you will, to shake. He uses various methods to shake believers' faith because faith is the key to victory over Satan. Faith is that regardless of how bad it looks, you know God's got this under his control. Faith is to depend upon the Lord in these trials and these persecutions and these afflictions. And so Satan wants to shake us like a rag doll, shake the faith out of us, because he knows that's the key to our victory over him. You realize, and I prayed it in a, uh, just a moment ago without thinking about this at, the, at that time, and that is this, that if you're a believer, you are in Christ and Christ is right now seated on the right hand of God on the throne, far above Satan and all principalities and powers, all evil spirits. And the Bible says that we in Christ are seated with him on that throne, which means that Satan and all of his evil spirits are also under our feet as well, meaning that we can depend upon the authority of the throne seat of Jesus to defeat the devil. 
when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, the first temptation, Jesus had fasted for 40 days. Satan comes along and appeals to his natural desires. See these stones? You're the miracle worker. Cause these stones to be made bread. Feed yourself. You remember Jesus' answer? He quotes from Deuteronomy 8. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When Jesus quoted that, every word is a specific term for what we would call the word of God. There are two main words, the most, uh, the most uh, popular word, I guess I would say, that the Bible uses to translate word for the word of God is the word logos, which I think simplified simply refers to the written word, the scripture. But the word that Jesus uses here, man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, is the other word that is not as used as much. It's the word rhema. And I believe that rhema is a reference to the word of God that the Holy Spirit speaks to you personally from the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit taking God's word and personalizing it and tailoring it to your specific need at that moment. And so in order to defeat the devil, Jesus is basically saying, look, you have to believe what the Holy Spirit tells you from the word and act upon it in faith. That's the key in this conflict that is a part of fellowship. In verses 6 to 8, there's a second part of uh, loving the brethren, not only fellowshipping, but communicating. Notice what he says. When, verse 6, when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and, and your charity and, and that you have good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now, we live if you stand fast in the Lord, if you're established. Communicate. Timothy joined Paul in the city of Corinth with the good news that the believers in Thessalonica, they were standing firm in face of the persecution. Uh, that uh, that they still that they had a loving respect for Paul, despite the fact that through his message they're now suffering uh, persecution. And so it's at this point that Paul writes this church, Thessalonia, a letter. Which, interesting to me, I think says this. The Word of God is the main tool, the main tool to ground, to establish, to firm up believing lives. So important that you not only hear God's Word, on a regular basis like this, you not only have God's word expounded to you like we're doing now, but that you yourself are searching the scriptures and you're hearing from God as, as well, one-on-one -on -one with him. You know, what's so different about this book that we call the Bible? We call it the word of God because that's what it is. We are told that all scripture, all scripture, has been given by the inspiration of God. Literally, has been God-breathed. God breathed the Scripture. Holy men of God were moved, were carried along by the Holy Spirit to then speak and write down what we call our Bible. So it is your supernatural people. You have a supernatural God in you. You have a supernatural book in your hand called the Bible. And then Paul goes on to say, and because of that, it is profitable. It's the thing that is most profitable for Christian lives. It's profitable, he says, first of all, for doctrine. In other words, that's where you find out what's right. 
but it's also profitable, he says, for correction. That's where you find out what, what's not right. And then he says, and it's profitable uh, uh, for reproof, rather. That's what's not right. And it's profitable for correction. That's how you get right. <laughs> and then he says, and it's profitable in the fourth area for instruction in righteousness, which is how you stay right, how you walk on the right path. And so the word of God is so vital for the Christian life. And uh, the case for the Holy Spirit to empower Bible believing, teaching, and preaching is made by Paul in this letter. We looked at to chapter 1, verse 5. We looked at chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, so important. But also... What about just the fact of you having, as a believer, the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God when you read, study, and meditate on the Scripture and apply it? This is essential to spiritual life and growth. It really is. A solid spiritual condition in the church is encouraged by the Word of God. The place. What place does the Bible have in your life? Is it on the peripheral? Is it uh, semi-important? Or is that what your life is really built upon? This is vital. And this is the communicating I'm talking about. It's believers communicating the Word of God. You know, let me encourage you just in a practical sense. One of the reasons why we have that lunch hour between our morning uh, service and our afternoon Bible study is so that you can have personal one-on-one -on -one fellowship with people. Not just joke and, and uh, sure, have fun, but I mean that you can have spiritual input into your brothers and sisters' lives. Remember? Concern there. And so can I encourage you, don't just glum on to the same person every week. Spread yourself around. Get to know your brothers. You know, sometimes there are people that are visiting and no one really speaks to them unless I do or I bring someone to them to introduce. You should seek people out like this. This is the way you express the love of Christ to people. This communication is so important that you, you share with them. You don't have to be dripping with the piety. It, it should be just the natural part of your conversation that you talk about things that are related to the Lord. There's a third and final thing I want to talk about here in this third chapter that really is, a, I think, a requirement uh, for people moving forward spiritually, not only fellowshipping and communicating, but in verses 9 through 13, you know what Paul's doing here? He's praying. He's praying for this congregation. He's praying for these people. And in verse 9, he's, he's praying, and in his prayer, he's thankful. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? You know, prayer ought to have a generous sprinkling of thanksgiving, of gratitude to God. That ought to be a part of all our prayer is gratitude like this. What Paul is doing here in these closing verses is he's telling us something very important, that it's not enough to teach the Bible. It's not enough to talk about the Bible with other people. We need to pray for God's life to be communicated through us. We need to pray for these people. We need to pray for one another. We need to be concerned about one another's spiritual well-being like this and be praying for each other. I hope that you have a church directory and you, on a regular basis, pray for your brethren here at Bethel. This is real brotherly love, is praying for one another. And notice... Some of the, the characteristics of Paul's prayer, 
not only is there gratitude, but look at the earnestness. He says in verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly. He's praying earnestly. Night and day he's praying frequently. And then he tells us what he is specifically praying for. Let's look at it. In verse 10, he's praying that we might see your face and might perfect or bring to completion that which is lacking in your faith. By the way, that word faith keeps popping up in, in these verses. Faith in verse 2, faith in verse 5, faith in verse, in verse 7, faith again here in verse 10, over and over again, because faith is so vital. And what is faith? It's trusting God. And so he's praying, and he's praying specifically that they that he might see their face. Why? Just so he can hug them? Just so it's good to see you? No, that I might finish what I started in ministering to you, that I might be able to complete what is still lacking in your trust in God, in your faith. And he says in verse 11, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. You know what he's praying for, if I can just put one word on it in verse 10? He's praying for their maturity. Pray for your brothers and sisters' spiritual maturity. Pray for the maturity. He's not, uh, he's not praying that God would prevent these negative persecutions and afflictions that are coming upon them? Not at all. But rather, he's desiring to be personally there with them so that he can teach them more fully how to live, or live a God-empowered life. That's what he means when he says that I might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. I want you to grow and have a deeper faith. God's not in the he's God is not in the business of protecting us from negativity. We might as well get that out of our head early on. You remember what Jesus said to Peter when Peter was so bold, he said, "Oh Lord, you don't understand me. Everyone else might forsake you, but I'll never forsake you." And Jesus replied and said, "Peter, let me tell you something." Satan has asked for you, that he might sift you as wheat. In other words, that he might sift you out and show you to be fake. But Peter, don't worry. That's going to happen. But I'm going to pray for you that ultimately your faith won't fail. And when you return into a right relationship with me, I'm going to use you to strengthen your brethren. That's maturity. God wants to bring that into our lives. Sometimes it comes through failure, like Peter's. It's a failure you need to understand. Failure is meant by God to be the back door to success, really. He turns it all around. Maturity. That's what he's praying for in verse 10 and 11. Look at verse 12. What's another aspect of his prayer for these brothers? And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Here's the second thing he prays for, specifically for maturity, secondly for charity. And charity is God's word for that divine supernatural love that no human being can muster. No human being can work up. It's a divine work in us. Charity is what... The, really, the mark of a victorious believer and a victorious church is this, that your love toward one another is increasing and abounding. It's overflowing. That's the mark of victory. How much personal forgiveness do we need to meet out for that to happen? How much listening do we need to do for that to happen? How much support do we need to give for that to really be true? 
it's vitally important how you respond to persecution, how you respond to afflictions. <clears throat> Sometimes they come through your own brothers and sisters. Doesn't matter what the source of it is. What matters is your response to it. That you grow God dependent to increase your love. You know, when the persecution comes from the outside, as it normally does in the Christian life, it comes from the lost, unbelieving world. It really makes your fellowship with your brothers and sisters much more precious. You need them much more. When you're feeling the pressure of persecution from the world, then you, you, you flock to your brothers and sisters in Christ for comfort. To love as Jesus loved, we need this kind of love toward one another that increases and abounds. It, it's not static. It's ever moving forward. It's ever moving upward. It's increasing, but it's also abounding. It's overflowing. Does that sound like you? Does that sound like me? No. That's something that only God can do in us. And that ought to be your prayer. You ought to pray for yourself. Lord, cause my love for my brothers and sisters to increase and abound more and more. Because it won't happen any other way. It won't happen unless you seriously are asking God to do that in you. And you might be surprised at how that he brings that about. It might knock you down first before it flows out of you and increases. It's a supernatural love that requires God enablement to have it. It is what Jesus said marks us as true followers of his. It's the hallmark of a church and of a believer. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have this kind of love, this kind of love for one, what kind of love? Love your brothers, he says, as I, Jesus, have loved you. Can't do that. Got to depend upon him. To love you as he loves me? That's supernatural. That's why it's a new commandment. It's a new commandment. It's his love for me. Then released through me to you. It's a wonderful thing, but you pray for maturity, you pray for charity, this kind of love in, increasing and abounding. And then the last verse, the prayer for these people, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. Here's a prayer for purity. To live right. To live right. It says holiness. Holiness is separateness. Basically, that's what it means. You're separate from everything and everyone else because you alone belong to God. And so you're separate. So live right because you're separate. You belong to God. Unblameable, he says in holiness. Unblameable in separateness. Unblameable means that you deal with whatever is wrong. It doesn't mean you're perfect or sinless. Unblameable means that you always are willing to deal with what is wrong in your life. You don't cover it up and pretend that it's not there. As believers, if we're going to live in purity, we not only need to pray that for ourselves and our brethren, but you know what? We need to hold each other accountable because you know what's going to happen? Jesus is holding us accountable. This 13th verse tells us that when Jesus returns, we are going to give an account. <laughs> of course, then we will be unblameable. Then we will be fully complete when Jesus presents us before God, even our Father at his coming, literally in his presence. 
we're going to arrive in heaven as the bride of Christ, as trophies of his grace. But we need to hold each other accountable now. We need to pray and live as if we expect Jesus's imminent return, that he is going to come back any moment. If you believe that Jesus can come back any moment, and that's what the Bible teaches, then it's going to impact the way you live, if you really believe it. And, and that's the key. We can say we believe this, that, and the other, but if it's not lived out in our life, we really don't believe it. You have to believe that no matter what happens in your life, God reigns. Samuel Logan Brengel was a commissioner for the Salvation Army many years ago. He was really a brilliant young preacher. And he ended up becoming the chief spokesman for the message of personal holiness. And one night, when he was preaching, a drunk continually interrupted the service that Brengel was leading. And finally, he had had enough. And so Brengel had him kicked out of the meeting. Well, after the meeting, Brengel was the last one to leave the building. He turned out the lights and he stepped out the, the front door. And as soon as he stepped out that front door, he was hit in the side of the head by a brick. This drunk had been waiting for him. And it smashed the other side of his head against the, the brick building. Well, he was hospitalized for a long time, and actually, he hovered between life and death. And when he finally began to recover, it was a long time before he could actually resume his former activities. So the editor of the Salvation Army magazine asked him if he would write some articles while he was recuperating in the hospital. He wrote what became several little booklets, which profoundly shaped the lives of many Christian leaders since. I say this because we have to believe that God runs our lives. God is running our lives. God reigns. He runs our lives. Satan can create ministry complications. Satan can mess up things and he can ruin our plans and, and really hinder. <clears throat> but God's in control. And God will use your circumstances to accomplish his purposes. God's the only one that can, that can produce fruit out of apparent disaster. You have to believe that. These people were suffering serious persecution and affliction. And Paul wanted to complete in their faith the understanding that God reigns and he's going to use this to bring about fruit in and through your life.